Hello. I was asked maybe two weeks ago to produce a video on Gödel and the economy because some Austrian economists have apparently been using arguments from Gödel to say that the economy is uncomputable, economic planning will never work, etc. So I've been working with my long-term collaborator, Greg Michelson, on producing this video. So let's hope you like it. So we're looking at Gödel, Turing and the economy. And we're going to give an outline of what's involved in debates around Gödel and to see what would be involved if the Austrians were right that this could be applied to the economy. You've got to get some ready ready for some pretty heavy duty logic and negations of the negation, something you might call dialectics. Now we'll start off with definitions. What's a formal language? A formal language has symbols. These are finite sequences from some alphabet and we consider the alphabet to be atomic. There is a syntax which are rules for establishing whether or not an arbitrary sequence of symbols is a well-formed formula, often written as WFF, WF. There are also semantics, rules for determining the meanings of well-formed formulas in some domain of interpretation. And this is commonly accepted what logic is, what formal languages are. Now, a theorem is some well-formed formula that is true within some domain of interpretation, where you can choose the domain of interpretation or specify the domain of interpretation. Now, I'm going to give a definition for something which sounds rather similar. A formal system has axioms which are well-formed formula schema which are always true. And it also has rules of inference, which are ways of constructing true conclusion well-formed formulae from true assumption well-formed formulae. And a proof is another well-formed formula. A proof that a well-formed formula is a theorem involves applying rules of inference one after the other, starting from axioms and known theorems until you get the well-formed formula you want to prove. If you have done that, then that is a theorem of the, of the, the formal system. Now, it might seem that formal systems and formal languages are the same thing. They're not. How do we distinguish them? Well, let's take some, one which most people will be familiar with, a formal language like Java. It does have a syntax and it has a mechanizable semantics. And that mechanizable semantics is given in terms of Java bytecode to which it is interpreted. But it doesn't have axioms or rules of inference. So Java is a formal language, but Java is not a formal system. On the other hand, predicate calculus is a formal system. It has axioms and rules of inference. And we can use predicate calculus to reason about Java. So, in that sense, predicate calculus is, would be operating at a meta level. Now, the debate around Gödel focuses on completeness, consistency and decidability. We say a formal system is complete if every well-formed formula can be proved to be either true or false. It is consistent if you can't prove two mutually contra contradictory theorems. And it's decidable if it's possible to determine it by finite mechanical means whether or not it, a well-formed formula is a theorem. The first two points are relevant to Gödel, the last point to Turing. Now all of this comes from a program set out at the start of the 20th century by the German mathematician Hilbert. And 
His program was about establishing formal systems that were powerful enough to describe mathematics and that would have these properties. Now, that project failed, and it failed because of Gödel and Turing. Gödel's theorem says that a formal system powerful enough to describe itself can be either complete or consistent, but not both. And it's important to realise this says nothing about a specific well-formed formula. It is a property of formal systems. Now, this comes to be relevant once we start thinking about the economy. And we want systems to be consistent, so we must accept that there may be some theorems which can't be proved if Gödel is right. Now, that was what Gödel's point was. Turing's point was to show that the decision problem couldn't be achieved, that self-describing mathematical systems are undecidable, i.e. there is no mechanical way to determine whether an arbitrary formula is a theorem. But it tells us nothing about a specific formula. It doesn't mean that specific formulas are wrong, but it says something about the system which was used to write that formula. It doesn't mean that maths is bunk because of Turing and Gödel. It doesn't mean that nothing can be proven. They do not mean that no theorem can ever be mechanically decided or proven. You can prove things. You can prove things by machine. But there are limits to what can be proven. Now, it took very considerable intellectual effort for Turing to come up with examples that were undecidable. And it does mean that there are certain general boundaries to computation. It means, for example, there is no universal prover of correctness for programs in most programming languages. But thus, this doesn't mean that there are no correct programs. It means there can be no algorithm to determine if a given lossless compressor achieves the maximum possible compression. But it doesn't mean that you can't build lossless compressors. Now, if we start applying that to economy, if you're going to claim that Gerd, Ger, Gerdel's and Turing's results establish something about economics, this is only meaningful insofar as economics itself can be formalised as a system which could describe itself. OK? Because Gödel and Turing's results are about formal systems capable of describing themselves. So is the economy a formal system capable of describing itself? If it were the case, if economics was consistent, then there will be assertions about economics that are true but can't be proven. But it's highly doubtful whether there are any such well-formed formula representing the economy that are self-describing. I mean, can you mark formulate markets and planning as well-formed formulae. Well, you can certainly put, um, formulate planning as such. Now, to get to the grips with Turing's result, we'll introduce the Turing machine. I have actually had lectures on the Turing machine before. Here's a picture of one. They are very simple formal systems that can do computation and they're equivalent to any known formalization of mathematics. A given Turing machine embodies a specific algorithm or what we would call an effective procedure for calculating something. The machine consists of a linear tape. On that tape are cells. Each cell holds a symbol. The tape may be of arbitrary length, or, but always finite length. And new cells can, in principle, be added to either end as needed.
there is a read write head here. In this case, the actual mechanical one, it does it by rubbing out uh, with a plastic rubber what was on the, the, the tape and it writes it with a pen. And it can inspect one symbol at a time and the head may be moved left or right over the tape. Now in practice that's done by moving the tape and the head stays stable. Computation proceeds in steps at, between numbered states. So you typically draw a Markov type diagram here showing the numbered states and you label the transitions by the transition rule that's being applied. Each rule specifies that you're in a given state, for instance this one here, with a given symbol. The star means any symbol and it says what happens then. You move from state one to state two, um, moving to the right, printing a star, whatever you had under it. The head is moved one state uh, to the left or right and a new symbol is printed. There is a special state which is the halt state at which point the program terminates. Uh, here. The computation starts in an initial state, inspects the, the cell under it, decides whether to move left or right, moves to the new state. It then finds a rule corresponding to the new state and the symbol under it and repeats. A very, very elementary computational process, but it's been proven to be perfectly general. You can compute any computable function with it. Now, an important point about this is there's a halt state. Now, some Turing machines are designed never to halt. The simplest starts from a blank uh, state, and if, it's, if it sees a blank, it writes an X and moves to the right repeats that in the same state. So it endlessly writes X's and never halts. But this property of endless looping is a general property inherited by subsequent uh, generations of computing machines. At the time Turing was working, in the 30s and 40s, tape technology was the latest thing. Um, and his proof of undecidability would have been literally unthinkable unless that technology had existed. His mathematical paper was a paper that drew on mechanical inventions which had taken place in the, the previous years and tape machines of various sorts were being mass produced at the time he wrote. This shows a, a typical um, telex machine using tape, Bordeaux tape, this is a computer that he was involved in working on to do code breaking, which had very high speed tape readers. You see the tapes here, optical tape readers, which were used for code breaking. Now, an important point about the Turing machine is that the rules are written as text. Here was the list of rules we had before. That is itself as a text. So the rules are symbol sequences. Turing observed that these symbol sequences could in fact, in principle, be fed into a Turing machine. And he defined a particular Turing machine, the universal Turing machine, which given an arbitrary Turing machine description on tape, would perform the same computation as a hardware implementation of that Turing machine. Because the initial assumption is that the Turing machine has a read-only memory which contains its program and which instructs it what to do with the tape. But he then says, OK, if I design the right read-only memory and put a universal Turing machine in it,
it can then read in a tape and execute that tape. And that's basically what every microcoded computer subsequently built has done. It has a something analogous to a Turing machine in microcode and that can interpret an instruction code. Now, if you do this, you get something that's universal. You get something that can perform any known formalization of mathematics. And these Turing machines are now used as the standard and an equivalent formulation is anything which can be shown to be equivalent to a Turing machine is said to be Turing complete. And in particular, digital computers running almost all standard programming languages are Turing complete. They're much easier to program than the simple Turing machine. Uh, the, the Turing completeness is easy to show. You can, for example, write a Java program that emulates a Turing machine or a program in most programming languages. Now, halting decidability was what he was concerned with. And he was exploring whether you could write a Turing machine that will determine if another Turing machine will halt. He showed this wasn't actually possible, and he showed it by a proof by contradiction. Let's assume that there exists a halting Turing machine, which we'll call HTM which takes as input another Turing machine alpha on tape and halts with the final symbol Y if it if alpha halts and no N for no if it doesn't halt. So we have halting Turing machine takes input alpha and says Y if alpha halts and N otherwise. OK, fairly straightforward. Now comes the proof by contradiction, the dialectics. You modify halting Turing machine. You modify halting Turing machine by adding extra code to it. So that if it writes a Y, it then enters an infinite loop. Whereas if it writes an N, it halts. So you add a few more instructions to your Turing machine, HTM, to get a new Turing machine, which we call non-halting Turing machine, NHTM. Now you take NHTM and apply it to NHTM itself. That is to say, you load your Turing machine with NHTM and then as a second piece of input, you get it to read in a cop another copy of NHTM. What this means is that if HTM would have halted on NHTM with a Y, then NHTM must enter a non-halting loop, infinite loop. On the other hand, if HTM doesn't halt on NHTM, then NHTM halts with an N. So this is a contradiction. And we have to conclude that it, no such program as HTM could possibly exist. Now, when people talk about an uncomputable function, it doesn't mean you can actually write the uncomputable function. What Turing is saying is the uncomputable functions can't even be written. This means that there are undecidable problems. Others include, for example, telling whether two Turing machines carry out the same computation. And the usual way to show that some arbitrary problem is undecidable without reasoning from first principles is to show how to convert it into a known undecidable problem. Same kind of thing with um, NP-complete problems. You show that an NP-complete problem can be converted into a, a, a known NP-complete problem. Now, let's take planning as an example. Planning algorithms can be formulated as Turing machines. That is to say, they can be written as algorithms. But formulating a planning algorithm doesn't require self-reference. 
planning algorithms don't take other planning algorithms as input. So the required self-reference that you need for undecidable problems can't arise. So planning algorithms are halting computations. The onus would be on the Austrian school to show, for example, that Kantorovich's algorithm was fallacious or to attempt to show that Kantorovich's algorithm doesn't terminate. As far as I know, they've never succeeded in doing that. Now, I've been talking about Turing and decidability. Let's look at Gödel and completeness. Gödel used a similar set of insights. His key insight was that a sequence of symbols, that is, say, a mathematical formula, can be encoded to and decoded from an integer using functions written in a formal language with a formal system of arithmetic. It is then possible to write other functions that just use numeric operations to check whether that sequence represented as a number is a well-formed formula, an axiom, a rule of inference, or a proof constituting a chain of axioms and rules of inference ending in a theorem. The method of doing so is highly complex, but the, the key idea is common enough now. The way he encoded symbol sequences was by having prime numbers raised to high powers. But that's not what we do now. But we do something very similar in any digital computer nowadays. Uh, a sequence of symbols is rendered as a sequence of bytes. And these can be viewed as a large number formed by summing. So the ASCII for ABC is 97 times 256 to the 0, 98 times 256 to the 1, 99 times 256 squared, etc. So in this case we're raising 256 to successive powers run raising prime numbers. Gödel demonstrates that it's now possible to construct a function sorry, that it isn't possible to construct a function that determines whether or not a well-formed formula is a theorem. The argument involves constructing a well-formed formula with a Gödel number n, which says in effect the well-formed formula with Gödel number n is not a theorem. Now that's something very similar to what Turing did. If it's true, then the well-formed formula uh, with Gödel number n is not a theorem, then it's been proven, so it must be a theorem, which is a contradiction. If it's false, then the well-formed formula with Gödel number n is a theorem, so it can't be a theorem. So we have an, uh, a mutual contradiction again, but it's even deeper in, Gö in Gödel's case. He's got three levels of paradox. So we have a contradiction. So for consistency of the formal system of the arithmetic, we can't admit the possibility of determining whether or not an arbitrary well-formed formula is a theorem. Nonetheless, it is a well-formed formula. It's a valid well-formed formula. So the system of arithmetic must be incomplete because there are syntactically valid well-formed formula which you can't prove. In effect, it asserts its own prov unprovability, so it must be true. So we have true things which are unprovable. But as I said, it requires considerable ingenuity to come up with examples like this. Both Gödel and Turing's examples rely on negated self-reference. They're descendants of a famous old ancient Greek paradox att uh, attributed to Epimenides. And the paradox of Epimenides says Epimen Epimenides the Cretan says that all Cretans are always liars. Now, clearly this is self-contradictory. 
And at a pinch, we could call these things examples of dialectical arguments. They derive their results from the self-negation of the negation. Now let's look at some bogus uses of Gödel's results. One of these relates to the relationship between mathematicians and formal systems. We've seen these results apply to well-formed formula, not formal systems, but they're commonly used to claim that formal systems have limits that humans don't have. The old claim that only a human could have constructed these arguments has long been displaced because there have been machine proofs of Gödel's theorems. Now, that prompts the response from idealists that the machine had to be guided in making these decisions. But of course, so did Gödel. Gödel was taught mathematics by others, and he made his contributions in an environment of other mathematicians pursuing Hilbert's goals. Pythagoras couldn't have formulated Gödel's theorem. The necessary background wasn't there. But they have no bearing on planning. They have no bearing on the technical feasibility of planning or performing particular sorts of computations. What matters for that is complexity theory set against the computational resources we have. Those are what matter when you're looking at planning an economy. These arguments are set out in greater detail in the book that I've written by jointly with uh, Lewis Mackenzie and Greg Michelson, the book Computation and Its Limits. And it's a general materialist account of what computation is.